and welcome to this special edition of Tell Me Your Story, New Paradigms for a New World. I'm Richard Dugan, your host. Hey, thank you for being with us here on the program. It's just a great pleasure to have you with us. You do know, because I've been telling you for the last almost 14 years, that we're here from on, on Sundays at 7 a.m. and 7 p.m., Monday mornings at 1 a.m., and our special edition, 9 a.m. Wednesdays, and we are streaming live at those times at richarddugan.com. We are also podcasting. I am so excited as of this broadcast. I did some expansion on the podcast, folks. And we're and I can't I don't even have a list in front of me. I couldn't even go through the list. It would take me the rest of the program to do that. But I actually spent some time because I was doing some work for somebody else in this regard. And I thought, well, shoot, I should be using these for my website, for my podcast. So we're everywhere. But the main ones are SoundCloud, iTunes, TuneIn Radio, Spotify. We are now on iHeartRadio.com. So you can listen to podcasts all over the place. TuneIn Radio, I think I mentioned, Blueberry, Player FM. Oh my gosh, Amazon Music. Uh, so folks, we can be found all over the place on the internet. And I hope that you will. I hope that you will listen to these programs and also watch them. That's what I said. Watch them. We are on YouTube. Tell me your story is the name of the channel. Look for the man. That's me with the hat uh, and the scruffy little beard here. And we certainly hope that you will watch these programs, listen to them. Go to our guest website. We'll be giving you their uh, our guest website here shortly so that you can continue what we like to call our transformational or evolutionary process. And um, also, if you would like to support this radio program, this podcast, this video cast with a financial contribution, we would greatly appreciate that. I, I haven't said this in a while, but I'm going to say it. We are not nonprofit, okay? So our your contributions are not <laughs> tax deductible, but we have been getting contributions. I have been asking for the last three or four years, and I have received incredible even as of this broadcast, I received a contribution that absolutely blew me away. I couldn't believe it. And I'm so grateful. It helps so much, uh, you know, and I am not going to play the game that I've said before when I was working for the religious station back in Phoenix, Arizona, between 1981 and 1995 <clears throat> or 80 and 8 and 95, uh, where they would say that if you don't support this program, it'll go off the air. You know what, whether you support it or not, we're going to keep going as long as I can keep it going. And if I can't keep it going, I'm not putting that on you. That is not on you. But what is, is your support, even energetically. All right, we will take that. And also we ask you, uh, sort of a call to action to participate. In the decade of perfect vision, the 2020s, we ask you to go within. Listen to that still small voice. Spend time at peace, in a calm state, listening. Uh, maybe there's nothing being said, and it's just a time for you to relax, to be at peace, to be calm, to rejuvenate, to re-energize, okay? So just take that time, if you would. Join, and it doesn't have to take five minutes. <clears throat> you know, <clears throat> if you're in your car, <clears throat> excuse me, and you're feeling stressed, and you're able to do so safely, pull off to the side of the road. Put your hazard lights on if you need to, unless you're in a parking lot, you just park. And just for five minutes, just sit there, close your eyes, turn the engine off, close your eyes, and just, just be, and be there with yourself. You're going to learn a lot, I guarantee you. Well, we're going to learn a lot today. This is going to be an interesting program. I haven't really dealt with this subject since probably 1987, 88, 89, <clears throat> when I interviewed the author of The Apocalypse Conspiracy, and I've mentioned his book and him many times on this program, John Noe. And it was a fascinating interview back then. I, I, if I can find that interview on tape, I may bring that to you. But today, <clears throat> because <clears throat> this is something that is so interesting to me, um, we're going to talk with a guest who has written an interesting book, and it came about in a very I think, wonderful and exciting way. Uh, his name is David Heron, David S. Heron, and he has written a book called The uh, High Sign, The High Sign, 
uh, the occasion of Jesus' second coming, uh, basically, <clears throat> Uh, and by the way, let me compliment you, David, on the fact that you used Jesus' apostrophe in a grammatically correct area. I have never understood how it is that people who went through English class, even in grade school and high school, always <laughs> want to put an extra S. It's not Jesus's. It's Jesus' apostrophe. If the name ends in an S, it's an apostrophe, ladies and gentlemen. That is the English lesson for today. Uh, but we're talking about that particular event that is written about, of course, in Scripture, in the Bible, the Christian Bible. Uh, first of all, thank you so much for joining us here on the program. It's a pleasure to have you with us. Well, it's really my, my, my pleasure, Richard. Uh, I've been looking forward to this. I really am, because a lot of people are anticipating real problems during the end time period which we're entering. But the Lord has it. And I'm just, I'm just getting this up front the lord has it and by that i mean no matter what the problems no matter what happens in the end he wins he has his way uh and he does not want us to be afraid he does not want us to be even worried so whatever we say this morning i do not want anyone to worry just remember the lord has his way well, you know, uh, you raise an interesting, <clears throat> uh, in interesting uh, um, way of putting that because uh, I have often talked with people on this program and we will discuss uh, the subject might even come up of, uh, you know, when we die, you know, well, what's going to happen? And I've always been curious about that when certain individuals pass away. Uh, I'm I'm not I'm not mournful per se, although I've had those occasions. My great my grandmother on my mother's side, I was I think seven, and it, it tore me up. And my mother almost had me removed. I was so emotional, removed from the church. Um, I've had other situations where people I got angry. How dare you leave you? You I was going to learn so much from you. Yeah, that kind of thing. <laughs> But the thing that really uh, struck me was the whole as aspect of uh, the judgment. And, uh, they, you know, they said, well, what are you going to say to God? I says, well, I've got two things to say to God. Number one is, uh, okay, um, I, uh, there's nothing I can say or do at this particular point, in, you know, uh, to change your mind. And you're going to do with me what you will. Okay? So I, 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 there's nothing I can say. Then the other thing that I would say is um, you're omnipotent, you're omniscient, you're omnipresent. You set all of this up. You knew all of this was going to happen. So this is all on you. But I go back to my previous statement. There isn't anything I can do about it. So, you know, cast me wherever you may cast me because there's nothing I can do about it. Uh, but the other aspect of it, too, is I would also acknowledge I am 100% responsible for the life that I've been given, okay? Nobody else. I am not a victim, okay? Not even of God, okay? Even if God set it up and knew all of this was going to happen. Uh, so uh, that's kind of the long and the short of that. But what I find interesting, first of all, let's, let's get some logistics regarding the, 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 the return of the Christ, okay? Ret the return. Uh, uh, as is written in the Bible, in the in the New Testament in particular, um, does it say? And 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 I'm uh, please understand. And as I'm sure you feel the same way towards me, everything that we discuss here, we're going to do respectfully. I am not here to challenge or castigate or or argue by any means. Uh, I'm just curious as to your perspective, and that's what this program is about. That's why we call it "Tell Me Your Story." But um, from what I have read from the New Testament specifically, there is nowhere in the New Testament where it says there is going to be a second. In other words, number two coming. It just says a return, but it doesn't say how many times. Am I? Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. The, the point is that whether you call it a second coming or a return, uh, Jesus himself answered the question about when they asked the disciples asked them about well, what's what what is this about your return when are you when are you going to come back and how that kind of thing mm -hmm. and he gave this long sermon which was actually as long as the sermon on the mount mm -hmm. four four chapters in, in the new testament and he did not say well i'm not coming again he gave all of these circumstances that will be existing 
when he does, uh, because he did leave then. He, he ascended into heaven and he was gone. Mm -hmm. And he did say he was coming back, uh, whether you call it a second coming or a return, whatever you call it, mm -hmm. he's coming back. Right. Okay. Um, so um, I guess what we want to talk about too is, is a lot of these um, uh, uh, celestial events. Now, Let's back this up just a little bit. I want to. I want to ask you from this perspective. Uh, as a Christian, why should I care? Why should it matter to me? Why should I even befuddle my mind with even considering? Uh, I know that this is supposed to happen. As a Christian, I know this is supposed to happen, but I really need to be about, as the phrase goes, I need to be about my Father's work whatever the reason was that I was put here to do. Not, not contemplating the return, uh, the rapture, Armageddon, the thousand years of peace, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I need to deal with the here and now. It seems to me like a lot of people, they're using this sort of as, as an escape, uh, like they're afraid to stay here and do what they've, they've been told, to, uh, that they've been asked to do, that they've been put here to do. What's your perspective on that? Well, it, it, it's, it's an opportunity. Uh, by that, I mean, there's going to be all kinds, as you know, if you read the details, celestial details, there's going to be all kinds of hassle going on up there and down here. Sure. A lot, and a lot of people are going to be scared. And one of the things that Jesus said in that sermon was, I want you to be ready. I want you to be watchful mm -hmm. because, uh, and this is elsewhere, actually as early as Zechariah, he uses the phrase day of the Lord, which Peter identified as the day of the return of Jesus. Mm -hmm. And he talked at length about souls coming into the kingdom of God. This was Zechariah from the Old Testament. Old Testament. So, so the opportunity would be, and I know three people who have been born again because of fear. They were afraid of this. They were afraid of dying. They were afraid of going to hell. Whatever it was, they were afraid. And somebody told them, well, you don't have to be afraid. Um, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. He died for your sins. Mm -hmm. And if you really believe that, you will go to heaven. And you don't have anything to worry about. And the gospel opportunities are going to be so great that according to Zechariah, when Jesus does come back, return, whatever you want to call it, one third of the human beings on the face of the earth will go up. And right now, if you look around, there are some countries where, where Christianity is, is nothing. And there are communist countries where it's not even allowed. And when people become Christians, they get killed. Uh, right now in the world, I, I would say that probably less than 10%, I think Billy Graham said 3% um, of the human beings are actually really born again Christians. So multiply that by 10, and you've got an incredible... Uh, human fruit for the kingdom of God to go up and be with him based upon um, perhaps initial fears that are allayed by Christians who are prepared to share without fear, to stand without fear and say, this is the way. And, and I, I really think that it's not a question of not doing what we're supposed to. He wants us to be prepared. Yes, we go about our daily business. Mm -hmm. But I think mentally and spiritually, uh, prayerfully, he wants us to be ready yeah. because these things are going to happen and the opportunity will be great from a spiritual perspective. We're talking with David uh, Heron, his book, The High Sign, and we're going to continue this conversation right here on Tell Me Your Story, New Paradigms for a New World. We are giving you choices and knowledge of those choices to help make your dreams come true. When I was uh, working for this Christian station for 15 years, I was exposed to a lot of different perspectives. Uh, I mentioned one of them from the author that I interviewed. It was actually one of the first books at that time, one of the first books I actually read cover to cover uh, called The Apocalypse Conspiracy, where he did a great deal of research. I did the same research he did uh, following the reading of his book because I didn't want to be saying, well, John said this and John said that. I wanted to make it my primary source information. So I laid out my Strong's Concordance and my Bible and I looked up the same things that he did, and I found the same things that he did. So it was really very interesting. But I also met a lot of different people 
uh, we had some very strange and unusual individuals. One gentleman who claimed to be from France, uh, he referred to himself as the Doctor of Christ. <clears throat> and um, his last broadcast, because of the what he said, was his last broadcast. He says yeah. uh, he was trying to get people to call in, especially to support the program. He says, don't you know I'm trying to save your lousy souls? And that was pretty much the end of his programming. Yeah, I guess so. And, and, and I, I just thought, wait a minute, there's another aspect of this too. And we're going to get into the story of how this all came to you. But uh, there's another aspect of this too. I'm sure you would agree that the relationship that you have with God, the relationship that you have with Jesus, it was always emphasized that it's your personal relationship with Jesus, right? Right. All right. It's nobody else's business but yours, right? Right, unless unless you have the opportunity to share, and somebody well, comes to you at, well, at, to me and wants them wants me to share, then I share. Sure, but but the point I'm getting at is, but when somebody comes to you and starts to challenge you on your relationship, I had this happen to me. I was told, Richard, I don't think you're ready to meet God. I don't think you're saved. And uh, this was from a Southern guy who had a program called uh, Give Me the Bible. And uh, he basically was, uh, he and his, uh, he, they were members of uh, the Church of Christ, and they, they just did not think I was ready to meet God. And I, I'm going, wait a minute, what business is of this of yours? I didn't ask you to judge me. I didn't ask you to, to go down a list of criteria in the top 10 uh, things that you need to look for to find a saved person. That relationship that I have with my God is nobody else's business but mine. That's kind of the point I'm making. Well, that's a good point. Uh, you ever have, have you had that kind of a challenge brought to you when you start talking, especially uh, about this kind of subject, uh, the second coming, the return, uh, well, and I've all of the events that are probably spoken about more specifically in the book of Revelation? Uh, how, how do you address someone who comes to you and says, you know, David, I think you're wrong. Uh, and here's where, and I'm going to show you book, chapter, and verse uh, where you're wrong. Are you? That's, I'm, I, <laughs> Your thoughts. <laughs> okay. Uh, well, I have had occasion when people out of the blue just came up and challenged my Christianity because they knew I was a Christian. So the answer is yes, I've, I've experienced that. Um, the individual circumstances will dictate my response um and i and i think they should because if it's somebody who's in in, in distress the first thing you, you need to do is to bring them comfort and, and you don't want to get into an argument you don't want to get into an argument anyway no but some people want to argue and it's, it's hard it's hard what i try to do is just to, to declare the word of god like um, he became sin for us who knew no sin so that in him we could become the righteousness of god now mm -hmm. that's that's the basis of my faith right there, that Jesus, when he died on the cross and sh shed his blood, became my, my savior. Yeah. But I don't want to argue with somebody about it. Um, and I, uh, I won't say that I'm not an argumentative person because as, as you get into my history, you know, this was for almost 70 years, I was a sports writer and I was the most competitive guy you ever saw. So I would argue anybody, but it was, had to do mostly with sports. And then the Lord's kind of tapped me and said, okay, now i got something else for you to do. Um, <laughs> May I ask what sport? Well, uh, I, I invented the Tindex system, which is a sports a statistical system for basketball that's been used around the world. Uh, but I also covered the Miami Dolphin football team in their initial season and, and in their first 10 years when they won a couple of Super Bowls. Um, I, I, I covered every. I covered the Cincinnati Reds for a while um, when Frank Robinson was a great player and Pete Rose was a jerk. Uh, <laughs> but I, you know, I'm, I'm, I covered the University of Miami football and when they were winning national championships year in and year out to the to the dismay of the NCAA because they, they did not produce as much revenue for the NCAA as when Ohio State or Florida State was in fun. But I, I covered them all and I and I played them all. And I could argue about any of with anybody, but then the Lord got a hold of me, and it it really changed my life. It really did. He really did get a hold of me. Uh, are you a father? Yes. Um, 
before you and I'm I, and again only I mean you can sort of answer this, but this is I, I, this now is getting into an area of personal information regarding your children, and, and only your children can answer this question. Um, but um, may I ask, are you as far as you know, as far as you know, are your children believers? Yes. Okay. Before they became believers, were your children precious to you? Of course. Inestimably, yes. right? Yes, of course. Okay. So then the reason I ask that question is because the messages that I used to hear during that 15-year period of my uh, career, um, we were nothing but lowly worms. We were, we're sinners, we're terrible, awful. As a matter of fact, to the extent that back then in the 80s and early 90s, um, if you were of a particular lifestyle, you wouldn't be allowed in the church. And I thought, wait a minute, but that's the place for them is in the church, you know. You're absolutely right. But what I, I, what I came to realize, uh, David, is that <clears throat> um, if, if, the, if, if God sent his son to be a sacrifice for us, yeah. That means that we had to have had value before the sacrifice. We were priceless. Yeah. We were still God's children even before the sacrifice. Yes, we were. And I do not know how it's possible because I don't think there's any math that could explain it. But somehow we became even more priceless following the sacrifice and our acceptance thereof. Yes. And see, that's the thing that is. It, it, it's it's not that he didn't that he loves us more now. He always loved us. Yes. He, you love you love your children. He loves his his creative children. Right. Um, beginning with the first two in in, in Eden, um, and he and he loves even now. If you look and say, well, boy, that's a really evil man over there. He's killed people. He's done this and that. Yeah. But but, but the scripture says God still loves him and wants him to return return. To, to, to the fold. Mm -hmm. uh, he doesn't stop loving someone because they sin, even though he himself knew no sin. Right. But he loves his children and wants them to be with him uh, when he rises to, you know, when we rise. Right. To go to him. Exactly. We're talking with uh, David Heron, his book, The High Sign. And uh, we're going to dive in here in the next uh, segment here to. Uh, how this subject came to the forefront for David here on Tell Me Your Story, New Paradigms for a New World. I'm Richard Dugan. Again, my guest is David Heron, and we'll give you the website in just a moment. David Heron, I want to thank you for being with us here on the program. This is a fascinating subject because I know that this, uh, this is something that uh, um, people yes as you mentioned at the front end of the program are very distressed and even fearful about they will become believers they will accept jesus as their personal savior out of fear and i've often felt that uh god is not an extortionist you know um you either do this i mean granted it's either god's way or the highway and and i use highway as a metaphor here um, but by the same token, um, I've also heard the phrase, God is not the author of fear, but of love, you know, that kind of thing. Well, that's not scriptural, but, 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 he, but it's true. Yeah. He is not the author of fear. Uh, I was just using that as a circumstance. No. Fear, can be, fear can be a circumstance opening up the gospel. So can, so can love. Yeah. Uh, there, there, there are all kinds of circumstances for opening up the gospel. Well, it's to me, it's 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 wonderful to see uh, that people are curious. I think that's great. W that, well, I'm curious. I have been from a very early age. Uh, it's one of the reasons I love doing this program. But as I've often said on this program, David, um, the universe asks the questions. I'm just along for the ride. You know, I don't know where these questions sometimes come from, but boy, it sure piques my intellect. Uh, you know, it even talks about in the Old Testament. Let us come to let let us uh, let us come together and, and reason together. Well, where do you do that? You do that in your brain, your God-given brain. So that's kind of what we're doing here today, and I'm I'm excited about that. But I want to know how this all began for you. As you say, at one point, as a sports writer, God <laughs> tapped you on the head. I love the I love the physicality of that, folks. If you, you if you're not watching the YouTube, you didn't see him tap his head, uh, as opposed to getting yeah. him hit uh, up the side of the head by a two by four, a a spiritual two by four. Um, 
but he got said, you know, I got something, I got something for you, I something else for you to do. How did that happen for you? Well, I was getting ready to retire from my journalism career, which was mostly sports writing. Um, and uh, we were talking about, well, my wife was still alive at that time. We were talking about where we were going to live, blah, 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 blah. And one day, just in the, the last year before retirement, I was reading the book of Isaiah, which I had read many times before um, because I really liked the prophecies, but I never really understood them very well. Mm -hmm. And I got to 6, 8, Isaiah 6, 8. And, and Isaiah kind of, you picture a little guy kind of crouching down in this temple, this huge red edifice, whatever it was, hearing the triune God talking among himself, so to speak, being the three in one. Um, and um, he, he says, they're saying, well, whom shall we send? Who will go for us? And Isaiah kind of jerks up, well, here am I, send me. And then you get the book of Isaiah, which is all the prophecies, which came to Isaiah after this encounter. And with me, as I'm reading through Isaiah, the situation was all of a sudden, I'm understanding them, which was, whoa. <laughs> It was, it was it was a miracle. You know, here I am almost 70 years old. I didn't really understand the prophecies very well at all, and especially all the figurative ones. And there are a lot of figurative ones. But then I really started understanding them. And one thing followed after another. And I began writing. I now have written, uh, I believe it's eight, eight Christian books in addition to nine sports books. And five of them are about the end time. And it really does appear to me as if we are now uh, getting into the prophesied end time. Uh, but for me, uh, it's, a, it's a whole different life. I'm not, I'm not used to being sitting here uh, and being interviewed. I, I'm interested in doing, I'm, my history is to be doing the interviewing myself and then writing about it. Um, and it, it's, it's a new adventure. And I just love the opportunity because it gives me a chance to share. Mm -hmm. Some of the amazing things that God, and there are some of these, I know we don't have time for them, but there are some really amazing things that I have learned in the last uh, 16 years since this began. Hmm. 16 years, and you're in your 70s now. No, I'm now in my early 80s. Oh. I, was almost, I was almost 70 when <laughs> when this <laughs> revelation occurred, so I jumped ahead. You know, I should be dead. I mean, why am I so healthy? Why am I have I have so much energy? I trip, I typify it, uh, attribute it to I believe that God still has some things for me to do. There's no no explanation for it any other way because I, I all the other eighty you know octogenarians that I know are, are you know they're kind of maybe not deficient but they're they're kind of weak, sluggish. Yeah. Um, I'm not, and and it has to it has to be God. It has to be. Yeah. There's no other reason for me. Well, my dad turns uh, 90 in 2021 here, August of, uh, of uh, 2021. Uh, 90 years of age. Mother will be uh, 87 in, uh, in uh, September of 2021. They just celebrated in June of uh, 2021. They celebrated their 60, 65th wedding anniversary. Uh, six kids, and I can't even, I, I know there aren't as many grandkids, but I know that they have several, both, uh, uh, both maternal, if you will, as well as adopted. Uh, my uh, second youngest sister uh, has, um, boy, I don't know how many kids she has, but she married into uh, a family of children and uh, a, a husband whose wife had passed and they had had several children. And uh, then I've got an elder sister who has one daughter, her, and her daughter has two kids, a daughter and a son. And it makes me a great uncle, which is kind of cool, but makes my parents great grandparents, which for me is exciting because it means that there are four generations running around on the planet. <laughs> and yeah. um, and it's just, it's just an extraordinary, the, our longevity, and it looks like we have that on our side and uh, staying healthy and all of that, and and keeping the mind sharp. And that seems to me part of the process, uh, I would say, for for you is, that yeah. this, does this help to keep your mind sharp? Not that it wasn't. I, I, I think that the Lord has just sustained it. 
I'm not talking about now here um, the diseases that de depress the mind. Right. Talking, but age. I'm just talking about age. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I people tell me that the high sign is, is my best book. Well, I was 80 years old when I wrote it, mm -hmm. um, and I think maybe it is my best book. Um, well, and, and of course, I don't think age has anything to do with it per se. Although that's a pretty, pretty great compliment, I think. Well, I think uh, it has to do with what the Lord has done. He, exactly. he didn't start me on something without giving me the tools to accomplish whatever it was that He wants me to do. Yeah, very exciting. The High Sign is the title of the book. We're talking with uh, with David Heron. Uh, he's an award-winning uh, journalist and author of 14 books. He used his background in uh, mathematics to develop the Tendex. Uh, uh, it's an internationally used statistical system for rating uh, basketball players. Six of his books have Christian themes, as he mentioned, including what the Bible has to say about the USA. And yeah. uh, maybe if we have time, we might uh, dive into that just a little bit. The website where you would like people to go so that they can learn more about you, learn more learn more about the work that you are doing. Where would you want them to go? Okay, I think it's a good site. It's end times, that's a plural times, T-I-M-E-S, mystery, that's singular, endtimesmystery.com. Now, I'm curious before we uh, pause here, um, why end times mystery as opposed to mysteries? Because somebody already had mysteries. Oh. <laughs> okay, I gotcha. No, that happens. I know. I was. Oh yeah, there's a lot. There's a lot of end time sites out there. Believe me. Uh, I, I, I'm sure there are. I'm sure there are. You're listening to Tell Me Your Story, New Paradigms for a New World. I'm Richard Dugan, your host, and we're talking with David Heron, and we're talking about his uh, book. It's not so much his latest, although it probably is uh, written a few years back, uh, called The High Sign here on Tell Me Your Story, New Paradigms for a New World, where we're giving you choices and knowledge of those choices to help make your dreams come true. David Heron, author of The High Sign, I want to thank you so much for staying with us. I wanted to ask you about something that came up in 1988. I know this is going back a few years. You probably weren't aware of it. Maybe you are. There was a gentleman in the summer of that year who was predicting the return of Jesus. And he said he'd done all the math. Okay? He'd done all, run all the numbers. And he said that Jesus was going to be returning September 16, 17, or 18. And of course, you know, everybody is curious and waiting and waiting. 16 rolls around, 17 rolls around, 18 rolls around, 19 rolls around, 20, nothing. A few months later, uh, he makes uh, an announcement that... Uh, he had uh, some of the math incorrect, and it was actually 1989, September 16, 17, 18. All right, so we go around to, to that period, and the 15th, and then the 16th, and then the 17th, and then the 18th, and then the 19th and 20th, nothing. And I don't think we heard from him again. I did. His name was Edgar Weisenot. Not so wise or not, because uh, by 2004, he passed. I, I actually did some research on him, you know, and we've got people predicting all over the place. Now, it is said that no man knows the day or the hour. So how is it that uh, have you and I'm just curious, you have not pinpointed the day or the hour you have just laid out the celestial signs as it were that's why your book is called the high sign uh you just laid out those signs to be mindful of is that a fair assessment yes and those signs were all the ones that jesus himself uh gave now there was another person who, who was tracing from israel's return in 1948 who started with 1988 also and predicted it and was wrong for 30 years in a row. <laughs> well, well, of course they're gonna be wrong because they're doing something that God said you can't do. Mm -hmm. And uh, 
one of the things Jesus mentioned a couple of times in his sermon, end time sermon, was there's going to be a bunch of false prophets. Do not listen to them. Well, anybody who predicts the return of Christ to the year or, or whatever is a false prophet. So we shouldn't listen to them. That's the bottom line. Mm. Well, it's and and I have to say it's really unfortunate in in that sense that so many people get caught up in in this particular topic uh, to in many instances, and we've seen this happen to the exclusion of living their life now. They they uh, they also think that um, maybe digging a deep deep hole in the ground and coating it with concrete and making a bunker and putting in all kinds of supplies is going to help them uh, because uh, you know well the end is coming and i mean every time we turn around and i remember back during that period of time there were a lot of conflicts uh, between uh, israel and egypt israel and the palestinians israel and whatever other group you want to la label and these people who were supposedly prophetic at least in their interpretations of the bible said and these are the signs and the end is coming i mean it'll be here probably in the five or six or eight months or ten years but you can see right there that this is what uh, isaiah said and this is what this person said in the old testament and on and on and on and nothing happened and nothing has happened to this point at least as far as we know do you think that um are, are, are how and i'm not asking you to give me a day or time but how close do you feel or think that we are? I mean, say in well, the next... I'm gonna I'm gonna go back to Jesus' sermon. Okay. Uh, he's very clear in um, leading up to that time. In fact, he gave it his his sermon. The events you could he would always say, "Well, then this will happen." Then it was it was in order. Mm -hmm. So we are probably now based upon his sermon, uh, where we're in preliminary phases of the end time. We haven't gotten to tribulation yet. We haven't gotten to, you know, what, what, there's a lot of things. We haven't, we haven't seen the, the appearance of the sign of his return in the sky yet. Mm -hmm. that, will, that will be one of the last things and we'll probably see it when it's far away. It doesn't have to, have to happen overnight. Like that's going to be probably be an extended period of time till, till it comes close and then maybe orbits the earth for a while, like it, like it has done in the past or like other, comments have done in the past, if this indeed is a comment, which I think it is. Um, but we had a book recently, and I'm not going to mention the author, but it was read by more than a million people, or more than a million bought his book. And he predicted that the sign of Jesus' return was going to be a lunar eclipse. Well, that's impossible for several reasons. The bottom line one is that lunar eclipses are only seen in a small part of the world. And the scripture clearly says that every eye will see him. It's not going to be just a few people. Mm -hmm. um, it's going to have, have to happen so that everybody has the equal opportunity. Jesus is an equal opportunity God um, in the sense that he, he, he desires for all to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. He loves people. He wants us to turn from our sin and turn to him. And he, he will express that in such a way that will be, it will be mighty, powerful, uh, a little bit scary, but the scariness not so much to, to terrorize as, as, you know, like communists and Nazis do, but to bring people to their senses. Sometimes a little bit of fear will bring people to their senses and say, hey, I got to do something here. Mm -hmm. um, and there's going to be some of that in the end times. There's going to be some frightening things happening. But as to as to the return itself, we're not going to know when. We're just not. Jesus, Jesus said he did not know when. He said the only, the only one who knows when is the Father, mm -hmm. the, the supreme being of the Godhead. And, and he, he, if he doesn't know, how are we going to know? We're not going to know when. Yeah. We're talking with David Heron. The High Sign is the title of the book. The website. Go to this website endtimesmystery.com endtimesmystery.com and david we will be linked to your website so people can go there and uh, find out more i also thank you so much for being with us here on the program tell me your story and it's it, i really appreciate your insights i want to ask you now um about how this came about there was an angel involved is that correct 
Um, not in this particular incident, but in a couple of other things there were. Um, now, well, I don't know. Maybe there was. I did not. I did not hear one or see one. But sometimes angels are sent by the Lord to get people's attention, and they're not necessarily going to shout in your ear. They might just tap you on the shoulder. I don't. There might have been one. There was a definite. Um, it was a distinctive urge to stop for a minute, look and listen, and then, of course, I prayed the, the prayer. Here, my sin, send me, uh, and then my whole life changed. Hmm. What about your family? Uh, uh, are you are you in a shall we, shall we say a lineage, if you will, uh, in your past uh, of your heritage, your your family, maybe the last two or three generations uh, of believers, where this is just part of. Uh, and again, you, nobody is uh, nobody's born a Christian. It's something that you have to uh, reach the age of accountability and so forth. Um, but is that something that has been a part of the family? I would say that most of the people in the family have been professing Christians, and I think probably um, most of them are. But to say all, not all, but I would say the majority of, of the family on both my father's and my mother's side uh, were professing Christians, and I believe they really were Christians. Now, I Most. know that uh, there's a big difference between having a ministry and being a minister, pastor, reverend, etc. Um, are You have a ministry, but you are not necessarily a minister. I had somebody pray. I had a pastor pray about that one time. See, my wife was perfect if, if you're if you're a pastor she was the perfect pastor's wife the leadership the, the, the sensitivity great absolutely phenomenal and so I, I said well you know maybe maybe the lord wants me to be a pastor i got my pastor of that time praying about it, my wife praying about it i prayed about it. the lord did not want me to be a pastor <laughs> he had he had other things for me to do which i am now doing no. But he did not want me to be a pastor. I don't think I'm my, I don't think I have the pastoral personality. Um, but in, in any case, he, he just did not. None, none of us got the word from him that they wanted me to be a pastor. He just, it just wasn't there. Just wasn't there. It wasn't in the cards, so to speak. <laughs> no, it wasn't. It wasn't in the Lord's. The Lord's just kind of shaking his head. No, you're not. You're not. No, <laughs> not you. Don't go there. Don't do it. Wouldn't be prudent. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> David David Heron's my guest. This is a pleasure to talk with you um, because, as I said, this can be a very uh, tumultuous uh, subject for some people. Uh, some people come at it from a position of certainty. Um, how long did it take for you to, uh, to, to get to that point where you felt that you had all... Uh, the dominoes, so to speak, in the right order, or your ducks in a row, or whatever metaphor you want to use, uh, that you were ready to release this work, because uh, obviously this took, this took, this, I mean, this is not a, it's not yes, a huge, yeah. don't get me wrong, folks. Uh, it is, um, what is this? Uh, let me, let me just take a look here. I'm, I'm grabbing my glass here. It is 362 pages, but it's not a huge book, folks. It, let me back it up so it's closer. There you go. It's not a big book, okay? Uh, but still, it, it takes a great deal of research, I would think. Yeah. How long did this take before from the initial catalytic moment until you finally had a copy in your hand? Well, this particular book, uh, I think it was about uh, 12 years. I think it was about three years ago when it was published. But, but it's been one after, thing after another, and it's not over. Mm -hmm. It's not over. I don't think this will be over until the day that the Lord takes me. Mm -hmm. um, it, it's it's just, it just gets more and more challenging, more and more fascinating, and there's more and more and more and more. You find out the, the scriptures and the, and the research is just inexhaustible. God is inexhaustible. He he, he is just so far above and beyond uh, mentally, physically, spiritual, however you want to say. He's just way way. And the research that we can do in our lim my lifetime is limited. In mine, of course, is limited to 15 years. So I'm probably a long way from, from the end of my research. What about the uh, conversation that one might have over the difference between a literal interpretation of the Bible and a more uh, metaphysical, uh, metaphorical, um, 
uh, a spiritual interpretation as opposed to that literal material interpretation of uh, the, the words of Jesus, uh, because as we are told many times in the New Testament, and specifically the Gospels, that Jesus, he spoke a great deal of the time in parables. parables. And parables, as we know, are not necessarily true stories. They're, that's one of the they're, things, they're symbolic. That's one of the things I did research, and I found that there are about 40 different types of writings, and about half of them are literal, and about half of them are figurative, and almost all of them are found in the Bible, at least in structure. You know, the novel structure would be the Exodus. Um, and there are lots of short stories, lots of poems, lots of songs, lots of, lots of everything. So um, I try not to literalize the things that are figurative. I do not think it's a good idea to try to get Christian dogma out of figurative speech, which would include the revelation. I, I just don't think it's very smart uh, because figurative is meant to be figurative. It's not literally factual. It's just something, it's a picture or, mm -hmm. or something like that, which represents something. Like there, there are representations uh, in, in the uh, all marriage, the marriage in the Bible, like in the Song of Solomon, that represents the relationship of Christ and in his, bride, his bridegroom, He's the bridegroom and then the bride is the church or all the people who belong in his kingdom. Of course, the Old Testament, that was not the church. That would be more uh, the, the Jewish side of it. But um, I, I try to avoid trying to literalize the figurative things. So, so even with, the, even with all, all the figurative prophecies, uh, I, I, there are always ways to get what you want literally out of them without without straining them. And I, I, try, I try not to strain them to bring out things that really are not, um, uh, not meant to be literal. Mm. I know that it's a big challenge for a lot of people. There was one gentleman I, I had a great deal of respect for, didn't necessarily agree with his, his premise per se, other than the fact that he, um, he took this position. This was one of the gentlemen that I uh, um, was associated with back in those days of, of Christian broadcasting. Uh, his name was Clyde Freeman, and he was an elderly gentleman then, so I'm sure he's since passed. I was in my 20s. I am now in my 60s. I'm 61. And uh, mm -hmm. he, uh, he was one of those, uh, thus saith the Lord scripture people, that if God didn't say it, if Jesus didn't say it, in other words, in the New Testament, if it wasn't red letter, uh, then he wouldn't he he wouldn't consider it. And uh, but one of the statements that he made to me was, <clears throat> as we were conversing one day off the off offline, he said uh, he said that um, uh, I I uh, my mind is going to remain closed to the point that it stays open. He was not willing, in spite of his position that he took, okay, on thus saith the Lord Scriptures, he wasn't willing to close his mind on anybody bringing him, uh, having a conversation with them and discussing the various issues that, that he would bring up. And I found that fascinating. Are, are you kind of along those lines as well? Um, no. <laughs> I don't even think I need to. <laughs> Go ahead. Uh, well, I was just uh, ask uh, your perspective. Uh, uh, lot, I, I is just had is a your problem. mind open to considering other possibilities? Uh, I, I will. I will consider possibilities as I read them in the Bible. Yes, but I won't just say "Thus saith the Lord," because mm -hmm. um, I don't think that's the way the Lord works. I, um, there are some "Thus saith the Lord" in the Bible, but not that many, um, and. In every case, there's there's a um, what's the word I want? There's a there's a surrounding scenario. Like for instance, in, in the Beatitudes, the not the nine Beatitudes. Mm -hmm. there, there there's there's a it's not just one isolated isolated. Thus saith the Lord. It's nine, and they're progressive. And the last two have to do with suffering. You know, well, what's a what's a blessing in suffering? Well. Mm -hmm. It can be, 
for the mm -hmm. person who is suffering if they have the right attitude. Um, so you can't really, but for, for another person, it might be the end of the world if they're suffering. Yeah. Um, it, it depends upon your response uh, to what is going on around you. Um, and I am, I am a literal person in the sense of, of, of not wanting to mess with Christian doctrine, um, literally. But I, I am a figured person. I love songs. I love music. Maybe after this is over, I'll send you a song that I just, oh, I think it's wonderful. Sure. Uh, so, so I think there's a place for that, especially in the heart. The, the, the figurative, the song, the, the rejoicing, the, you know, it's, it, it's not even literal. It's just something that transcends. Um, but if you want to get down to the nitty gritty facts, stick to the literal. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, I've often contemplated this. I'm, I'd love to get your perspective on this. Um, I've read the Bible a number of times, Old and New Testament. And I've kind of come to the conclusion that everything beyond the book of Acts, uh, not including Revelation, but beyond the book of Acts, but up to uh, book of Revelation, actually didn't need to be written if the people in that day had gotten the message in the first place. Because it seemed to me that all those epistles were answering questions of controversy from those particular areas of the world where Christianity was growing, where the churches were growing. And it's like the book would have been much shorter, the four Gospels, the Book of Acts, and the Book of Revelation, and that's all we need. Because all the other stuff is, is just moaning and groaning and complaining, and, and Paul and Peter and whoever else wrote these other epistles. You know, if you people would just stop fighting amongst yourselves and just listen <laughs> to the message, we wouldn't be writing all of these letters. I, I, I agree with that from the perspective of, of, you know, the people not listening. But I also find um, useful things for me, such as mm -hmm. in Ephesians or spiritual warfare. Philippians is full of wisdom. Um, and, and practical wisdom for people, not just then, but for now. People haven't really changed all that much. Um, we have the same problems they did. And, and the, the Bible does offer solutions. Uh, the epistles do offer solutions. Paul was Saul. He was a murderer of Christians, and then he became Paul. And he changed completely, but he had the perspective because of his past of being able to relate to people. Yeah. Um, and I, and I think that the, I think that the uh, epistles do relate to people. At least they do to me. Yeah. Um, a little broader uh, perspective question, if you will. The Old Testament, uh, this is just my observation, and I'd love your, your perspective on this. The Old Testament speaks of uh, a covenant or a contract, right, that we had with God in the Old Testament. Uh, and, of course, this, of course, spoke of... Uh, uh, the Messiah, it, it spoke of 613 laws, it spoke of the Ten Commandments, and all of these different things. But it also spoke of a new covenant, a new contract that was coming, mm -hmm. okay? And that when Jesus came, he established that new contract. In other words, he signed off on the old one saying, okay, this one's done. This one is no longer, it's null and void. Here's the new contract. The new covenant and the new law is one. The law of love, period. End of story. Love your neighbor as yourself. Uh, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. I, 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 I've rephrased that a little bit, and, and I certainly hope the good Lord will forgive me. But uh, I say, do unto others as if you were the others. <clears throat> you know? Why would you do that to yourself? if you wouldn't do it to someone else, you know what I'm saying? Uh, would you cheat yourself? No. Well, then why would you cheat this person? Would you covet that person or that person's wife or its possessions if it was you? No. Well, then why are you doing that to that person? <laughs> that kind of thing. Um, and it just seems to me that we've sort of lost perspective on that because so many people are still living with a bunch of the Old Testament laws, the, some of the 613 of them, 
uh, that are, are part of the old covenant and they want to beat other people up with certain of those laws in, in today here in the 21st century, uh, even back in the 20th century, when they're no longer valid. It, it, the, the law, it's the law of love. You know, we're not living under uh, because then I would say, okay, well, how about the one law that says uh, in the Old Testament that uh, your daughters and your wives must go away for one week out into the wilderness during their bleeding time, and then they can come back. Did you do that with your wife and your daughters? I don't think so. Well, then why is it that you're using this other one, let's just say uh, 462, uh, to beat the daylights out of these people for living a particular life or doing certain things? If you're not sending your daughters and your wives out into the wilderness during that that one week period, you can't have it both ways. That's well, my perspective. What are your thoughts? I think, first of all, that uh, Jesus addressed these things in his sermons and his talks, and a lot of it is quoted in the New Testament. But he never really, uh, with his speech and his actions, he never abolished the Old Testament. He quotes it a lot. Sure. But what he what, what he did was when he died on the cross, shed his blood for the remission of our sins, that was the new covenant. Mm -hmm. We accept that by faith or we, or we reject it and say, well, I'm gonna, I'm gonna stick with the thou shalt nots um, and that's not gonna get you to heaven. Um, but it doesn't mean that thou shalt not murder is not still a valid commandment or thou shalt not steal. They are valid. It's just, they're not gonna get you to heaven if you keep them. Because mm -hmm. now the focus of the heavenly attention is on Jesus, who came for that very purpose mm -hmm. to die for our sins. Um, but mm -hmm, a lot of the good stuff in the Old Testament, a lot of the stuff in the Old Testament is pretty good, and he does quote a lot of it um, as very as being very practical uh, for our for our for our living. And wouldn't you also say, though, that a lot of what he quoted in the Old Testament would be covered in the New Covenant law, the law of love? Love your name. Well, he covers it in just that way. He covers it in exactly that way. Yeah. He applies it in what he said. He applies it to the law of love. Exactly. That's exactly what he does. Um, um, it, it's it's built. He built upon it. The Old Testament is not invalid. It's just a, a foundation. But but he built a, a mansion on top of it. Right. Uh, I think let me good. ask you, and I, I, I probably already know the answer to this question, but I'm still curious as to your response. Which is more important, the person of Jesus or the message that he brought? Oh, boy, that's a tough one. <laughs> it was tied together. Um, mm -hmm. Well, certainly, certainly his sacrificial uh, death, burial, and resurrection is, is probably the, the most important thing to both. Well, to me, that's the most important thing because that opens my way into heaven. But everything he, everything he did and everything he said was important. Uh, I don't really want, I don't think I want to answer that one. Okay. But, no, no, that's okay. I, but, I, but I really, but I really, I really, I, he really said great things and he really did great things. So, um, it's hard to distinguish, really. You know where he talks about how uh, his, uh, he's having a conversation with his, his followers, and he's performing all these miracles, changing water into wine, healing people, raising the dead, et cetera, et cetera. <clears throat> and they are just, they're dumbfounded. They're just in awe. Like, wow, that is, and again, I paraphrase, this ain't King Jimmy here. <laughs> yeah. yeah, right. It's and he, they're just, they're, they're just mystified. It's just incredible, you know? And, and they're going, wow, look at the stuff you're doing. Could you teach us how to do that? And of course, his response, if, if I'm paraphrasing correctly, is, well, sure, I could teach you how to do this, but let me tell you something. You think this is great stuff, turning water into wine, raising the dead, et cetera, et cetera. Ugh, you know, forget about that. You guys are going to do greater works than these. And I'm sitting here thinking, what could be greater than healing the sick and raising the dead and so on and so forth? And this is, this is my observation. Love your perspective on it. Well, I, 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 I think, think it great, has to do with he I, was there. He well, was God. Let, let me just say. I think the greater work that he was talking about 
was transforming our lives. Even if that means, if that in fact means, of course, the acceptance and the following of Jesus and his message, it would be transforming my life, having that personal relationship and conversation with God. Yeah, and, and when he speaks of greater works, of course, he as being God, he could do anything he wanted. Sure. So, so, so it really was no big deal for him, even though it was wow to us. So for us who are limited by our humanity, we, we can't do what he did. But I, I think he wants us uh, in, our, in who we are mm -hmm. to do the very best we can. And when we can achieve something that uh, approaches to what he did, it's, it's much more of an accomplishment because we're human. And yeah. we are not God. That's something that is not usual for us. Whereas for him, who was the living God, he was also a human being, but he was the living, the son of the living God. It, it really was not all that difficult. I mean, for us, it's much more difficult because we have limitations. Yeah. I want to ask you about uh, will, God's will versus our will. And maybe not so much versus, but our will and God's will. Now, I use this analogy quite often, and I told you earlier that if I were standing before God, I would say, I take full responsibility for my life. I'm not a victim. I did the best I could with what you gave me. I did the very best I could, okay? I followed the very best I could. Um, I use this analogy of an individual, a believer, uh, who is walking around, they have their hands cupped in front of them, and if you could place your personal will, okay, in your hands and and they were walking around in this beautiful green meadow going i just want to do god's will i just want to do god's will i just want to do god's will and they toss it in the air and god in tears over the fact that one of god's creation wants to, one of his children wants to do his will yeah. catches that personal will of that individual and as god is tearing up over this incredible gesture by this child. He's compressing that person's will down into the size of, say, a baseball. To use a sports analogy. And he rears back, this is God, and he throws a 90-mile-an-hour uh, Nolan Ryan fastball mm -hmm. and hits that individual right in the forehead and utters the following words then do something with the life I gave you. You are not a puppet on a string being manipulated by forces you do not understand. A lot of people sit around wanting to do God's will, and what they're doing is they're literally sitting around waiting for God to almost physically pick them up, levitate them, and move them about. What are your thoughts about this aspect of doing God's will and our own individual will or free will, if you will? Yeah, I've actually thought a lot about it and did some research on it about, I call it puppeteering. And that's, I think you use that analogy because God certainly is able, if he wants to just pull the strings and get people doing what he wants, mm -hmm. but he does not do that. And he does not expect us to expect him to do that. Mm -hmm. um, he gives us our own free will. And that's what we use to do right or wrong, good or bad, his will or not his will. But he, he just, he's not a puppeteer. And, and I agree with you on that. I can't really add a whole lot to it. Um, we are uh, his children and children have their own will, as you know, yours did, <laughs> and mine, and mine did. <laughs> They're very willful, yeah. and um, being a very willful person myself, I, I know where that comes from too. <laughs> the human will, the human will, is is really an adventure for God, because He's allowing us to have our own parameters outside of His perfect will, and often we wander off, um, but He does not pull us back like a puppeteer. He does not do that. It's just the way he is. I, I don't know, you know, what his thinking was, but I, well, I do. I think he I think it's more of an accomplishment 
to, to cope with the human will and bring it to himself than it would be if he would just think, okay, now you're on this string and I'm taking you exactly where I want you. I, I think it's more, more of a uh, blessing to him and a challenge to him uh, when we are wandering around doing our own thing, but come back to him. Yeah. Uh, and if he had just pulled us back like a puppeteer. When you were raising your children, what was your goal? Um, well, the first one was that they should that they should become believers and have the des their destiny in heaven. And then, of course, individually, each one, it goes from day to day. You know, the, as they grow up, well, well, what should be their professions and, and uh, what should be their attitude toward premarital relationship, that, that kind of thing. Uh, I think we all, as parents, we deal with that sort of thing uh, with our children but ultimately it's where the, where will they spend eternity that's 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 the biggest one mm -hmm. where will they spend forever but but from the standpoint of being a father would all of those still apply or as a father raising children in this material world uh it, was there a more was there a higher, a more profound goal, or maybe not so profound, uh, in terms of what you wanted, shall we, if I can put it in this context, what you wanted to accomplish by bringing children into the world? Uh, well, yeah, of course. Yeah. Um, well, you, you, I think it's, I think God instills in humans the, um, and in others, and in other creatures, the uh, will to reproduce and to love the reproduction. Um, you, you see birds that just love their, their, their um, offspring. And the sandhill cranes, when they, lose, when they lose a baby, when a gator gets a sandhill crane baby, they screaming, it, you, it's like you never heard, they're, they're in such agony over mm -hmm. the loss of this child. And you would, you would I, I just wish that everybody who contemplates aborting a baby could hear the sand you know, cranes when they lose the baby. Uh, it's just, it's just so uh, sad. Uh, and uh, I, I, I just, I just think that. Well, I'm going off on, on a different subject now, but it's all right. But I, I, I really think that. Uh, I think that one of the things in this country right now that's causing one of the biggest problems is murdering 75 million babies and I, I don't think god likes it at all and i think we're seeing some of the judgment of god right now and it's not pleasant to look at i understand i do indeed i will tell you uh to be quite honest um that uh it's a subject that i would do interviews uh with uh people on both sides of the uh, discussion up until about 1985 86 maybe 1987 what I found was neither side was willing to give any ground, and so I stopped doing them. I don't, I will not do interviews regarding that subject simply because uh, it is not a conversation, it's not a dialogue, it's a battle. And one side says, We're going to win, and the other side says, We're going to win, and it's like nobody's winning. Nobody's winning. Well, I think, I think we're, we're all losing because the babies are dying. That's what I think. But no, I don't, I don't, I don't want to, I don't want to get into into an argument. No, no, no. And, and it, that's, it's, that's, just, that's, it's just something that came to me because I, I think it's one of the things we're dealing with right now in the United yeah. States of America. Well, I know that a lot of people feel that way. They have felt that way since uh, since 1973, when Roe v. Wade uh, uh, <clears throat> was uh, ruled upon by the Supreme Court, and uh, you know, and of course, uh, uh, different states and organizations and this and that and the other have been working very hard on both sides. Uh, and it's like, come on, let's let's uh, <laughs> back it up just a little bit here, folks. Just back it up. We need to reevaluate uh, why we're doing what we're doing. And uh, and then we can maybe we can move forward as a better better as a civilization. So uh, that would be my perspective. David Heron, I I I have to tell you how much I enjoy chatting with you, talking with you, especially about the high sign, which is your latest work. I love the picture on the cover, and you had mentioned this too. <clears throat> it's a picture of the globe, and then you've got this comet that's circling it, and that's yeah. one of those celestial signs that uh, that you made reference to earlier in the program, right? That is the sign. Um, it, it, it's really, there are seven possibilities for the sign of Jesus' return. That is one of them. It's the only one 
that meets all of the qualifications that Jesus himself gave in his sermon. That's in uh, Luke 21 and Matthew 24. The others don't even meet half of them. And, and the comments are just so big and so powerful. Yeah. NASA, NASA calls them indes indestructible missiles. Um, <laughs> when I heard that, I was, I, was expecting, I was expecting to say, well, if the comet comes, we're going to nuke it. Yeah, you're not going to nuke it. The comets are way beyond nuking. They, they can blow up the whole world. Um, anyway, that's, yeah. that's part and of it. And yet we've had comets. I remember, I think it was the late 80s, early 90s, and I can't remember exactly when. When hail bop, hail bop went through. Okay. And we also had a group called Heaven's Gate. And they basically, that was their perspective and their, they, it's somehow they, <clears throat> they got the perspective of some philosophy that, that said, when this comet comes through, we're leaving because it's going to be the great ship that's coming to take us away. Oh, that's, false, that's false prophecy. Oh, absolutely. But, 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 but Jesus did, um, his, his um, sermon prophesied the, events that do occur when a comet is present and i'm not talking i'm not i'm not talking about minor events i'm talking about worldwide stuff right. goes way beyond an asteroid way beyond anything else uh, and that's why i think it, it, it of ultimately a comet will be the sign of jesus in return because it just goes so far beyond everything else um yeah everything else is just a midget compared to the comet i hear you i hear you and from what what is the because i have a feeling you're going to be around a long time my friend and i hope that you want to be <laughs> i'd like to get through my 80s well let me tell you something my father when he turned 70 we were sitting around the dinner table celebrating his birthday and i asked him so dad what's it how's it feel to be 70 and again this was 20 years ago and he says, well, I got, uh, I got two responses to that. Number one is, uh, I didn't expect to live this long. And number two is, but I'm glad I'm here. Uh, I would venture that you feel pr maybe the same way, that you didn't expect to live this long, uh, and definitely that you're glad you're here, especially with the passion that I can feel uh, from you in talking about the high sign, talking about where you are from a philo and I like to refer to it as a philosophy, a philosophical uh, yeah. perspective. Um, your faith, your beliefs, and so forth. You kind of do you do you feel that way? I have a tremendous passion for 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 what I am doing now. That's uh, and I, I think I got that from God. Uh, I didn't have, when I was in sports, playing them, refereeing them, writing about them. I was all this competitive monster. Mm -hmm. um, and then God just changed me. Um, and now and I'm kind of a empathetic um, pushover. <laughs> um, but not when it comes to the scripture, not when it comes to the faith. Uh, it, it, it's, it's, it's really, I really think it's a good change um, to love music like I do now, to, 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 to really love uh, the creatures that God created. Uh, dogs, cats, even the squirrels, you know, um, and things like the sand hill cranes. Uh, it, it's just, it's just good. It's just good. And I, and I really do think I'm, I am in God's will right now. Well, we congratulate you on uh, the work that you have accomplished thus far, both as an author, uh, of several uh, books uh, with a Christian theme, as well as as a sports writer. I myself am a, an avid baseball fan. I, I don't care who's playing. I just love watching the game. I am, and I have to say, I am very grateful uh, that I come from a World Series town. I was born and raised in Phoenix, Arizona. And when we got the D-backs, I, uh, I thought, oh, God, it's probably going to be a decade or more before they even get to the playoffs because they're a brand new team. And four years later, we're playing who? The Yankees in the World Series. And I had a real good friend of mine who was from New York. And after they, they got beat by the D-backs, he says, oh, it was a fluke. I said, are you kidding? They beat us three straight in New York. Come on. Yeah. 
I still can't. Rem- I still can't believe that uh, the manager of the D-backs back then uh, put on the mound. Uh, I believe his last name was Kim uh, for w- one game, and he kind of blew it, and l- we lost that one. And then he put him back on the mound the next night, and I'm going, wait a minute. First of all, don't you usually give the pitcher a rest, even a day? But to put the losing pitcher on the mound for game two, please. But we came back and had a great time, and I I can now say I'm from a World Series town. It feels so good. Uh, I have to say that um, even before I was listening to Larry King on the Mutual Broadcasting Network back in the uh, 70s and 80s, and I even worked for a station that carried his uh, his programs. Uh, I loved listening to the stories he would tell about baseball. They just warmed my heart because I I just love the game so much. Uh, it's uh, I, 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 and I guess the best way to epitomize it, uh, a musician by the name of Terry Cashman, who used to he has uh, produced these songs called Talking Baseball when there were only 28 teams. And of course, the D-backs aren't listed in the in the in the teams there, of course, because this was before they were in. And he had another song. It was called Baseball in Ballet. And I know a lot of people think the game is too slow and all this. It's like then you don't fully understand the intricacies and the beauty of this game. And so I've I've always loved baseball. I wish I had been able to play it. I didn't have the vision for it as a kid. But I still just absolutely love to watch the game. Put take the business out of it, you know. <laughs> yeah, I agree. I, I grew up a Yankee fan, um, and uh, I was one year too early for for the little league. Uh huh. So I, I wound up, but I wound up playing about twenty five years of, of hard nosed um, uh, men's softball. I mean, very hard nosed men's softball. Um, I love the sport. I love the Yankees. I was there when Mantle came on the scene, and everybody hated him. He was he was almost inhuman. He could run faster than anybody else. He could hit the ball faster than anybody else. And the Yankees always won, so they hated him. Yeah, but I, I, I loved them because I was a Yankee fan. Well, I will tell you that when uh, there was a period when I I don't want to say that I loved the Yankees, but I loved watching them play when Reggie Jackson was on the team yeah, good. because you always knew this man was going to make the game very, very interesting. When, when I go back about 25 years before you, when Mantle was in his prime, he, he just diminished Jackson. I mean, Jackson was a great player, but Mantle was just above and beyond. Yeah. He, he, just, he, he really was. And people, yeah. I would scream and yell when he struck out because they were scared to death of him. Yeah. And see, this is the part of the game I love. I don't, I don't know the statistics. I don't know all the numbers and that kind of stuff, batting averages. Although I have to say that as a job, as a baseball player, specifically a batter, every single player should be fired only because, only because they are productive 33% of the time. If you, as a sports writer, were only productive 33% of the time, you'd be fired. And yet, they consider that to be really good. Yeah. Well, baseball, it is really good. But, yeah, uh, I know. Softball, softball, even in fast pitch, is not that great. It's 33. Yeah. But I, I love that. Uh, I love that about the game. And I love some of the, the fascinating statistics. We actually have a program called Golf Radio. And they talk about all the different sports, including baseball. And we have this little quiz every once in a while. And one of them is, what are, what are the eight ways? of getting on base, on first base. And we go down the list. And I actually threw in nine and 10. uh, And one, nine was an executive order by the president. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. They they write so many of them, right? That'll work. (laughs) Uh, But then there was a play not too long ago, you may have seen this, um, where uh, the ball was hit to, oh gosh, what was it? I'm trying to remember the exact play. I, I've got to look it up. But it was like the ball was hit to the third baseman, and uh, the player on third base was running to home. And rather than throwing the ball to first base to get the out to stop the run, he threw it home. The catcher missed it, and the guy made it to first base, and the run scored. And so we realized uh, that it's a, a player's choice 
can also get you on first base. Yeah. Field, fielder's choice. Fielder's choice. Or, fielder's or an, error, an, an error. In that case, it was an error too, wasn't it? Oh yeah. I just, I, it's, I but I love the, I love these, uh, uh, the, the, the way some of these games turn out. My favorite, of course, nineteen, I believe, it was eighty-six Dodgers and A's. And uh, Kirk Gibson, and this was in game one. I it, it would have been better if it had been game seven, ninth inning, bottom of the ninth, uh, two on, two out, uh, full count, and he hits the home run. Same place that, um, oh, uh, what what was his name? Now I can't remember. Um, Eckersley. He hit the same. He hit the camera out in 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 uh, uh, out in the right field, and Gibson put the ball out there in the same place. But that was game one, which but he did it once in the game. I think he did it once in game seven too, didn't he? I, I Gibson, think Gibson Gibson had these the legs were gone. He yeah. had a very good player. It may have, that legs, may have been the legs were gone. So he uh, hit, when he batted, it was all upper body. He couldn't yeah. give it on his legs. That, that's all and he had. It was so dramatic. I remember that too. It was it was great. It was oh, great. But this is part of what I love about sports. Uh, specifically baseball is is these kinds of conversations the memories that we have of uh, of the players that we remember as we were growing up uh you know oral hersheiser pitching for the dodgers and and tommy lasorda behind the down in the dugout and then you come running out there and going nuts with the with the yeah. umpire and all that kind of stuff uh great i memories remember, the I remember sandy Koufax. you remember sandy Koufax? uh a little before my time well, he, he only lasted about five years because I think his curveball wore out his arm. But ah. talk about a dominant pitcher. He, he was the most dominant for those five years that I have ever seen. He just he would just beat you. He was just great. Nolan Ryan wasn't bad either, let me tell you. No, he was not bad. <laughs> but Kofax, Kofax had both the fastball and the curve. Yeah. Ryan was mostly a fastball. You know, our listeners are hearing this and watching this, and they're going, what does this have to do with the high sign? I'll tell you what it has to do with the high sign. It has to do with the high sign because it was what you, David, said at the beginning of the program. We're not here to make you fearful or anxious or uneasy. That's right. We want you to uh, understand that I think, David, you and I, we, we uh, may agree on some things, disagree on others. But I think the one thing we do agree on is that uh, we want to be happy. We want to be joyful. This right. is a great life, isn't it? It is. It's a great life. Mine's better than ever. I'm in my eighties, and and we hope that you continue on. I really do. I really as long, I I say this to I, I haven't said this to my father because I'm not sure how well I don't know how how we take this, but stay as long as you like, Dave. Uh, Dave. Please stay as long as you like. As long <laughs> as you want to stay here. As please. long as he will let me. Right. <laughs> And I hope that your kids and grandkids and great grandkids, if you have any, are, are around you as well uh, to bring you the same kind of joy uh, and thrill that uh, uh, that we're all ex trying to experience these days as we are, as they are saying, getting back to normal. Um, I myself, I've been working straight through from day one from the pandemic starting because I was considered one of the essential workers here in broadcasting to keep people informed. Um, but. I thank you for bringing joy and happiness and and some excitement to uh, to our broadcast here on Tell Me Your Story. Well, thank you. I feel the same way about about you, Richard. Great host. Thank you. Thank you. I I want to uh, first of all thank you for being with us, David Heron, and the website is the uh, End Times Mystery endtimesmystery.com will be linked to your website as well. Uh, I have three final questions that I like to ask every one of my guests. You may have addressed them, uh, addressed it a little bit uh, within the context of the program, but I like to ask them directly. But before I do, I have to address the listeners and viewers uh, and tell them, tell you folks, uh, that uh, this program is here on Sundays at 7 a.m. and 7 p.m., Monday mornings at 1 a.m., and the special edition of Tell Me Your Story, Wednesdays at 9 a.m. I think you're going to enjoy that one too uh we're pot we're streaming live at those times i get a little tongue-tied because i go too fast slow down we are streaming live at those times at richarddugan.com the podcasts the full interviews if you're listening to the 9 a.m or, or any of the others on the radio broadcast and the live stream it's not the whole thing because sometimes we go more than 46 to 50 minutes in this case an hour and 24 minutes for this interview thus far 
Uh, and uh, you're going to want to go to the podcast on SoundCloud, iTunes, TuneIn Radio, iHeart, uh, Stitcher, Player FM, Blueberry. If I didn't say Spotify, let me say that again, Spotify. We're also you're uh, on video you can watch these interviews at youtube and it's tell me your story just look for the guy with the hat okay and uh, so i hope that you'll do that if you'd like to support the work that you, that we are doing you like the programs and the guests that we're bringing to you and you'd like to be a part of it financially we would greatly be appreciative of that i have to say that as of this broadcast i received a donation the largest i've ever seen i was I, I, I thought I had to bring up the email three times to make sure that it was the right number. I couldn't believe it. And I'm so grateful to that contributor. But if you'd like to be a part of it, uh, we would love, we will take it in gratefully. And thank you, thank you, thank you for those who have helped. And thank you, thank you, thank you to those who will help. And we also hope you will spend time going within, spending some time, even five minutes, uh, with uh, going within, spending time during this, the decade of perfect vision, because it's only when you go within that you have perfect vision. Listen to that still small voice. Spend some time in that quiet, peaceful place. And uh, I think that uh, you will, just as David has, experienced a great deal of joy and peace and calm in his life as, as he has lived out his faith and his beliefs. And uh, we are so grateful that he has joined us here on the program. So with that all being said, <clears throat> again, my thanks to you for being with us. And I encourage people to go to your website, which is End Times Mini Mi blah, 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 blah. End Times Mystery.com. End Times Mystery.com. And again, we'll be linked to it. First of my three questions. Who is David S. Heron? Oh, uh, well, the first thing that comes to my mind is I'm, I'm a child of God. Um, first and foremost, um, I'm not I'm not a slave of God. I'm a child of God. Second question, what is it that you hope to or want to achieve through the work that you are doing now? It is my hope and prayer that uh, people will be, especially Christians, will be prepared for what lies ahead so that they will not fear, they will not worry. Jesus says, don't even worry. I've got it. Um, that they will be ready to minister love to others who are going to be needing it. They'll be willing to share the good news of the gospel with those who will be needing it and wanting it, and even asking for it. Um, so that's that's really what I, I hope to accomplish by sharing what God is doing in me and what, according to the scriptures, he's going to be doing during the end times. Mm -hmm. And finally, what is your life's purpose? Hmm. I think we just kind of answered that. Um, really, that's it's what, what we just said. My, my, my life purpose now is it, it's what we, what I, I, as, as I just answered the other question, mm -hmm. I'm trying to think, is there something else? Well, no, I think okay. that answers my life purpose. Well, thank you. Thank you for that answer. And we thank you again for joining us here on the program. And we do look forward to talking with you again, uh, even if even if uh, we just sit here, sit around the old uh, microphone and just reminisce about baseball. That'd be great. I'd love it. <laughs> By the way, the thought has occurred to me when it comes to uh, what you just said about about uh, uh, God having this right to use a, a military phrase. He's got our six. He does. <laughs> David Heron, thank you again. And I encourage people to pick up your book, The High Sign. And it's available, I'm sure, on Amazon and even through your your website, which is endtimesmystery.com. I again thank you so much for giving us so much time here on the program. Well, I appreciate you having me. And I'm Richard Dugan, and I thank you for listening and watching. Tell me your story, New Paradigms for a New World. We are giving you choices and knowledge of those choices to help make your dreams come true. And until our next broadcast, podcast, videocast, love to lol.